Good morning everybody, it's Midnight and Beyond, here with a very last second top 10 video. Those of you who follow me on Twitter know that I typically like to write big ol' reviews for any new games that I end up beating. Well, I kinda dropped the ball on that this year, and I don't really see myself having the time to play catch up. I still wanted to talk about the games that I played this year though, so I thought I'd join in on the top 10 video game review thingies at the end of the year extravaganzas that people tend to do and stuff. So yeah! That's what I'm going to be doing. Though before we begin, there's a few things that we need to keep in mind. First off, I obviously haven't played every new game that came out this year, so if a certain game you're expecting to be on this list isn't here, that's why. Here's just a quick example of all the games that came out this year that I really wanted to play but simply haven't gotten the chance to yet. Second note is that this top 10 is actually going to be split in half. There'll be my top 5 games that I played this year that did not come out in 2018, and then the top 5 games this year that did come out in 2018. I know that on the interwebs it's easy to get all caught up in what's hip and happening, so if you end up missing a game when it first comes out, you might not give it the time of day later down the line. So this is my way of encouraging you to try out any older games that you may have glossed over in previous years. And finally, I just wanted to apologize in advance that because this is being made to the last minute, the production of this video is rather... minimal. Just like the production of Smash Ultimate's World of Light! Oh, Okay, moving on. More on that later. But with all that being said, here are my top 10 games of 2018. First off, my top 5 games that I played this year that did not come out in 2018. Number 5, Doki Doki Literature Club. Well, this wasn't a game that I thought I'd end up playing, but here we are. It certainly helped that the game was free, as well as the fact that I played it alongside a group of friends. I definitely don't think I would have enjoyed this game as much as I did if I was playing it alone. I don't think I'd even give it the time of day if I was playing it alone. I honestly can't talk too much about this game without spoiling the twist of it all, so I'll just say... It's a dating sim where something happens, and it is just really unexpected. That's all I can really say. Play for yourself to see what I mean. Just be forewarned that this is not for the faint of heart. Playing with a group of friends is definitely recommended. If you want to see me play with my group of friends, I was actually part of a full-blown let's play of the game over on my collab channel, Viz Nomadic. So if that interests you at all, feel free to check it out. And be sure to pick up some KFC along the way. Uh, inside joke, you'll get it when you see it. Number 4, Finding Paradise. I'm sure this game would have been on a lot of people's top 10 games of 2017 lists if it hadn't been released in mid-December. I wound up LPing the game blind as I adored the prequel To The Moon, which I was very late to the party to. If you love To The Moon, there's no doubt that you'll love this game as well. If you have yet to play either of them, I highly recommend you get on that immediately. These games are renowned for having some of the best writing in video game history and for very good reason. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll be stuck with a million questions, and you'll slowly start discovering the answers as you make your way through this fantastical story. Simply put, it's amazing, so play it. Number 3, Ever Oasis. This is a game that was simply in the right place at the right time. It came into my life during a very depressing time and provided the source of sunshine that I was desperately in need of. The best way I could describe this game is that it's as if The Legend of Zelda and Animal Crossing got married and had a very, very adorable baby. The game has two separate aspects to it, one where you're trying to build up an oasis into a healthy and thriving community, and another where you're going into dangerous dungeons where you fight monsters and go on several quests and missions, advancing the story and whatnot. You'll end up filling your oasis with a variety of residents who all run their own types of shops. Rather than buying stuff from them, you actually go out into the field and find materials for them that they need in order to run their shops. And all of the residents can actually travel with you, each of them being playable and having their own unique moves and skill sets. This game honestly did every single thing right. I thought it would end up being very overwhelming, but it was actually really easy to understand all the mechanics and inner workings of the game. They don't throw too much at you at once, and just as soon as you start thinking to yourself, gee, I sure wish this was a feature to make this task a little bit easier, that exact idea you had ends up being unlocked as a feature in the game. Presentation is where this game really shines. The graphics are really fantastic, I love watching the sunset while in the desert and seeing all the sand sparkle in the moonlight and the soundtrack is expansive and very addicting. The gameplay has just the right amount of challenge without being too aggravating, but the absolute highlight for me is the writing. The game is just so stinkin' cute. All of the characters are so stinkin' nice to each other and have such cute and funny lines of dialogue. Something else I found really interesting is that, despite how cheery and funny the game could be, a lot of the characters suffer from anxiety and several other insecurities. Every single character has a story that you end up unraveling as you progress through the game. And I noticed that a lot of the characters have stories that center around them wanting to run their shops in an attempt to help them better themselves as a person. 
It was all really sweet, and I loved watching them grow and build their confidence throughout the game. If you want a game that just makes you smile a whole lot, this game will definitely do the job. Of course it isn't all sunshine and rainbows, but if you just keep pushing forward with all your new friends and newfound confidence, I'm sure there isn't anything you can't overcome. Except maybe the labyrinths, those things are terrible. Number 2, Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. I'll be honest, I was one of the naysayers from the very beginning who rejected this game as soon as we heard about it. I actually didn't hate the Rabbids all that much when they were first introduced. I think it was due to the overwhelming and, in my opinion, undeserving popularity of the minions and their obsession with brain-dead nonsensical humor that made me start to compare the two, and it led me to have my hatred for the minions spill over into becoming hatred for the rabbits. I'm all about collabs and crossovers, and I'd love to see Mario branch out into new unfamiliar territories, but if you told me that the world of rabbits was where Mario was headed next, I wouldn't be able to take you seriously. But now that I've actually played the game in full, I could honestly say without hesitation that Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle is not only my favorite game on the Nintendo Switch at this point in time, but it is also one of the best games I have ever played. They did literally everything right with this one. I love how unsettling the game feels to have these happy-go-lucky Mario characters team up with these twisted and corrupted rabbit characters. The writing and the cutscenes are the highlights of this game for me, and to say that about a Mario game is astonishing. I haven't been this surprised and enjoyed a story in a Mario game this much since probably either Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door or Super Mario Galaxy 1. The graphics and music are also legendary, and I'm sure you've seen and heard plenty of it by this point. The gameplay is something entirely new to both Rabbid and Mario franchises. You could become easily addicted to building up all your characters into your own personal play style, as well as finding all of the weapons that have such amazingly detailed designs and hilarious descriptions. And to top it all off, the Donkey Kong Adventure DLC is by far the biggest DLC I've ever seen given to a game before. It's more or less a whole extra game considering how stinking long it is and how much content is within it. If I had to list any complaints about this game, there were a few graphical glitches when playing through it that need to be ironed out, and there was also a glitch that gave me the reward for 100% completion even though I haven't 100% completed the game yet, but now that I have the reward the game will tell me what collectibles I'm actually missing and where to find them. And as much as I adored the game's story, I kinda wish the ending was a bit more fleshed out. But other than that, Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle is an absolute masterpiece of a game that needs to be experienced in order to be fully understood. It just goes to show that you can never judge a book by its cover. And my number one favorite game that I played in 2018 that didn't actually come out in 2018 is... Undertale. Yes, it took me until 2018 to play Undertale, stink and sue me. I know I was very late to the party, but I am so glad that I finally arrived. I don't think there's much that I could say that hasn't already been said. It's an absolute masterpiece of a game in terms of story, music, characters, etc. It manages to be hilarious, yet terrifying as well as absolutely heartbreaking. I won't be forgetting this story for a very long time, and I'm sure I'll enjoy Deltarune just as much when I end up getting around to playing that in about three years. Yeah, let's hope it doesn't actually take that long, but I honestly wouldn't be surprised. And now it's time for my top 5 games of 2018 that actually did come out in 2018. Let's get started. Number 5, Blade Strangers. Or as I like to refer to it as, Code of Princess 2, baby! Well, not the baby part, just the... Y y you know what I mean. The sheer unbridled amount of joy I felt when this game got announced is more excitement than I've felt for any game announcement in a very long time. I'm sure you don't need me to go into my love and adoration for Code of Princess, so let's just talk about Blade Strangers. It's not the Code of Princess sequel of my dreams, unfortunately, but it gave my small little guilty pleasure game an enormous spotlight that I never would have in a million years believed would actually be possible. I've lost count of how many times I've watched that opening cinematic. I'll probably never get sick of it. As for the game itself? Okay, I'll be honest, I'm not too into fighting games besides Smash Bros, and this game's story mode doesn't really offer the super awesome crossover or cinematic experience that I was hoping to see after watching the game's opening a million times. You'll be in and out in like 10 minutes or so. But for fighting game enthusiasts, I've heard nothing but good things about this game. If this is your genre, play your part in making this game more well known. If all goes well, we may very well get to see that Code of Princess sequel that we've all been dreaming of. Or at least the one that I've been dreaming of. Number 4, Detroit Become Human. This is a game that interested me the second I saw the Kara trailer back in 2012. Yeah, it was that long ago. I remember seeing that for the first time and could not comprehend video game graphics getting any better than that. 
Well, fast forward six years later, and the final product blows the initial teaser video out of the stinking water. I looked back on the Kara video over the years and just kept on wishing that it actually got made into a full-fledged game. The whole concept fascinated me to no end, and I just wanted to see where this character was headed. And now that I finally got a chance to play the game, I'm a bit mixed, honestly. Some things this game does completely right, but others I wasn't super jazzed about. I kinda wish Kara's segments were a bit more action-oriented. You got plenty of those when playing as Connor and Marcus, but I feel like Kara's journey through the game is too disconnected from the rest of the plot, almost to the point of it being there simply to appease the fans of the Kara video from 2012. My personal favorite story arc in the game was with Connor. It had the perfect blend of action and character development. Being paired up with Clancy Brown in all your segments doesn't hurt your campaign either. The game isn't perfect, but it definitely pleases the urge I had for this idea to become a reality. Okay, time to make people angry. Number three, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Time to make everybody mad! Okay, so I can't go into my thoughts on Smash Ultimate without spoiling World of Light, so if you don't want to be spoiled on that, skip to this time in the video to avoid any and all spoilers. You good? Okay then, let's get salty. Aside from new characters, obviously, number one on my wish list for Smash Ultimate was to have a return to story modes. Super Smash Bros. Brawl's Subspace Emissary stands as one of the coolest and most revolutionary campaigns Nintendo has ever pushed out. But when Smash 4 was lacking in any sort of story mode, specifically stated by Sakurai because he was upset with people who uploaded the Subspace Emissary cutscenes to YouTube, that is an incredibly foolish mindset to have. While I don't support people who upload cutscene or boss compilation videos to YouTube, especially for games that aren't even released yet, cough cough, whether you like it or not, this is the world we live in now. You can't stop the information era. It's here to stay. So going out of your way to make your game less of a spectacle than you could have made it, simply because you don't like how people are interacting with or using the media that you're creating, it's just sad, honestly, to think about what could have been but didn't end up happening for such foolish reasons. So when Smash Ultimate seemed to be making a return to story modes with World of Light, I was stinking ecstatic especially after seeing that cutscene in the final Smash Direct that got me hyped up for the adventure I was about to experience. Well, I hope you enjoyed that one cutscene because that's all you're ever going to see for the entirety of World of Light. Okay, that's not entirely true. There's like two more cutscenes in the game, none of which actually have any characters in them. Because you're building your roster from the ground up and because there's so many branching paths throughout World of Light, the game can't have pre-rendered cutscenes for every single possible combination of characters you would have at that point in the game. So when you reach the midpoint of World of Light, you fight Galeem and see a cutscene of him being destroyed. No other characters are shown because the game can't predict who you have at this point. It's just this stupid ball of light that they've deemed to be a character and a bunch of master hands exploding into oblivion. But then wait! The true villain appears! You then see all the master hands getting destroyed by beams of DARKNESS, and then a DARK BALL appears after Galeem's demise. When watching this, I was literally saying to myself, I swear to god, if his name is stinking Darko or Darkon or whatever, I'm shutting this stinking game off. And sure enough, his name is stinking Darkon. And unlike Galeem, who wanted to gleam and cover the world in light, Darkon wants to darken the world and fill the world with darkness. Such riveting storytelling. So you then go through the second half of World of Light, have like three fights with Crazy Hand because apparently they didn't have any other bosses left in this game, and then you fight Darkon and beat him as well. But then, oh no, Galeem is back and Darkon is still standing. Now they're fighting each other over who gets to destroy the world. You see a quick, quick glimpse of like five Nintendo characters standing on that stinking cliff again, but then five seconds later the cutscene ends, so who even cares? You're then in the final stretch of World of Light and have a choice on who you want to fight. If you start fighting spirits on the right side, Darkon becomes more powerful. If you fight spirits on the left side, Galeem becomes more powerful. If you fight all of them, however, you could fight both Galeem and Darkon at the same time and put an end to them both. If you beat Darkon, Galeem takes over and covers the world in light and the screen goes white, presumably turning everyone into trophies like he did at the beginning of the game. But if you beat Galeem, Darkon covers the world in darkness and you get a very hilarious shot of Mario dropping to his knees and presumably dying. But it's literally just a zoomed out shot of Mario and the rest of the screen is just filled with darkness. 
Because it's not like this game has a roster of like 80 characters or something like that. No, why would you think that? But if you beat them both at the same time, you get to do something incredibly amazing? I won't spoil what that is because I really want you to experience it for yourself, but it is by far the best part of World of Light, and unfortunately the only good part in my opinion. But after that part, you fight Galim and Darkon at the same time, and you get to experience the true ending where all of the spirits are freed and returned to their respective worlds. And how is this presented in the ending cutscene? By a stinking light show where you see a bajillion lights fly into space as the stinking credits roll, and the song Life Light plays for like the millionth stinking time. Not a single video game character is seen. It's one thing to not have a story mode, but it's another thing entirely to pretend like you have one, only to let me down so hard after realizing it's all big stinking sham. So here's what I think went wrong with the development of this game. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is the most ambitious project Sakurai has ever taken on. So for a project to be so stinking ambitious, it needs the amount of time that's necessary to make it as perfect as you want it to be. Ultimate had a significantly shorter development time than the previous Smash Bros. games, and considering how many features are missing from the Ultimate Smash Bros. game, such as home run contests, break the targets, and some fun side modes like Smash Run or Smash Tour or Event Match, not to mention the fact that there aren't any trophies in this game, but instead are just a bunch of 2D images from previous Nintendo games. It honestly just feels like a game that hasn't been finished yet. I feel like if it had just one more year of development time, this game would have all of these things in it. But because the Smash fanbase is as rabid and demanding as all get out, I know that announcing the game in 2018 and releasing it in 2019 wasn't an option for Sakurai. Not without immense backlash from self-entitled fans anyway. I know I may be sounding way too harsh on this game, but it's because my expectations were so high for it, and I'm not gonna excuse its faults just because it's Nintendo or just because it's Sakurai. So that's why Smash Ultimate isn't my game of the year. But how is it still number 3? Because in all the time that they didn't put into the side modes, they put a thousand percent more time into the core of the game. Smash Bros is always enjoyable and something I'll always look forward to playing. I love the game, I love the crossover concept, the roster is absolutely legendary and puts every other fighting game to shame, and when playing just straight up Smash Bros, this is the best it's ever been. The graphics are stunning, the soundtrack is legendary, the stage selection is amazing, even though it doesn't have pokey floats, and they finally added Squad Strike, which is a feature I've wanted in Smash Bros for years. I am so stinking happy that it finally exists, and despite my gripes with the whole spirit concept, I still haven't been able to put the game down, and I probably won't be able to until I obtain all of them. I'm 800 spirits in, and with 500 more to go, I'm sure I'll be busy with this game for a long time to come. I like how I can make little amounts of progress in it with just a few minutes of gameplay. About to go to sleep? Play Spirit Board for 5 minutes. Taking a dump? Play Spirit Board. Waiting for food to finish cooking? Play Spirit Board. Car ride? Spirit Board. Plane ride? Spirit Board. Thankfully this handheld Smash Bros experience won't result in any broken consoles, hopefully, and the performance is more or less just as good handheld as it is on the TV. So yeah, while there are a million things I wish got added to Smash Ultimate, that doesn't negate the fact that I'm still playing it and enjoying my time with it. Also we have Joker coming as DLC. Come on, what else could you even ask for? Besides Chibi Robo, of course. Oh boy, that was a long one! If you decided to skip over the Smash Bros segment, welcome back! Man, I seriously can't believe you unlocked Goku as a playable character at the end of World of Light. Okay, moving on. Number 2. I'm actually giving this spot on the list to three different games. All three of them are remakes of older games. I usually don't like to put remakes or re-releases on lists like these, but 2018 was filled with a lot of really stellar remakes, so I felt that they were worth mentioning. For number 2, I have Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee, Luigi's Mansion 3DS, and of course, my beloved Code of Princess EX. Let's start with Pokemon. I wasn't too thrilled about returning to Kanto for, what, a fourth time at this point? And I really wasn't too keen on the idea of having Pokemon Go gameplay become the main method for catching Pokemon. But this isn't meant to be Gen 8, so I could accept it as a simple side experience that's just meant to make you feel good. And it certainly accomplishes that. My absolute favorite feature is that Pokemon actually appear on the overworld with you. It makes the game a million times more immersive and makes it a thousand times less tedious when going through routes and dungeons. If you want to avoid random encounters, simply don't walk into the Pokemon you see on screen. 
I did not use one repel throughout my entire playthrough. I really hope that they keep this layout for future Pokemon games. It not only makes things a heck of a lot more convenient from a gameplay standpoint, but it makes the overall presentation of the game so much more immersive. I also hope we get to continue the trend of traveling party member Pokemon in future games. I stinkin' loved watching my partners walk alongside me throughout my adventure, and I love getting to ride certain Pokemon throughout the game. In short, Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee is meant to be a fun little trip down memory lane. It isn't replacing Gen 8, so don't be too upset if you didn't like the layout of this game. Just enjoy it for what it is, and let it fill the void for you while we wait for Gen 8 to release later next year. Now for Luigi's Mansion 3DS. Luigi's Mansion is one of my most played games of all time, so I had a lot of expectations to be met when going into this 3D remake. First off, I wish it was on Switch. I really wish it was on the Switch. I know they put it on the 3DS because that's what Dark Moon was on and also because the GameCube was originally going to be a 3D console and they wanted to recreate that original idea and whatnot, but man, I really wish this game was on the Switch with HD graphics and a more comfortable control scheme. Especially after seeing that Castlevania trailer, like, oh my stinking god, I wanted a stinking M-rated Luigi's Mansion game now, it looks so stinking cool. Anyway, as for how this game goes, it's a true blue port of Luigi's Mansion. They don't change much, which I'm very happy about. I was worried they would alter fights or enemies to make them less scary or less difficult for a new generation, but thankfully that isn't the case. The game also includes a boss rush mode where you try to beat all the bosses one after another, and the Hidden Mansion is also changed up from the original game, which is really cool. Not as cool as the PAL Hidden Mansion, but still cool nonetheless. The game also has multiplayer where you could play as... a solid green model of Luigi that they decided to name Gooigi. The funny thing about this is that the character is sent by Professor Egad of the Future, aka the Egad from Dark Moon. And when he brings Gooigi over, he gets super tutorial heavy when explaining how to simply set up a two player mode. I like to imagine that this was the game developers poking fun at themselves for how tutorial heavy and handholdy they made Dark Moon. Thankfully, they didn't add any new tutorials or handholding segments into the remake, aside from that one gag with Gooigi. But what's also funny is that at the end of the game, Egad from the future actually scolds you if you finish the game without ever trying out the multiplayer feature. Well, I would have tried it if it was online compatible, like the Dark Moon Scare Scraper, but unfortunately it is not. So I unfortunately had no one to try it out with. But whatever. The game still has a ton of stuff to do in terms of the gallery's boss rush mode, the new hidden mansion, and the new achievement board. While I'm honestly not too hopeful for Luigi's Mansion 3, seeing as it has the Dark Moon art style and what appears to be a lot of Dark Moon gameplay mechanics, I'm still looking forward to it. And if it isn't all that great, I'll still have the originals to look back on, as well as its really stellar 3DS remake. So if Nintendo's willing to remake Kanto a bajillion times, here's hoping they'll port this game to the Switch sometime in the future, along with even more new and exciting features. And finally, Code of Princess EX. This remake is weird, in all honesty. It adds new things that I like, such as easier level ups for the main cast of characters, and being able to actually play as the full cast of 8 in the main game as opposed to just the first 4 of them, but at the same time, it went and removed a lot of things from the original, such as the English dub, which I think is outright required in order to fully enjoy this game, as well as the option to customize your character's stats as they level up. On one hand, I could try and advertise it as saying that both versions are worth your time and offering something different, depending on what elements are important to you, but on the other hand, I gotta be honest and say that this remaster is missing a lot of key elements in order to be truly called a remaster. If you don't really care about the dub or customizable stats though, you'll love the Switch version. It looks great in HD and the soundtrack sounds amazing on your television. Plus the gameplay is a lot more comfortable on a Switch than on a 3DS. But if you want to save some money and go with the 3DS version, you honestly wouldn't be missing out on much. And now, at long last, my game of the year for 2018 is... The Walking Dead Season 4 The Final Season. And I know that this may seem controversial to some. First off, the game isn't even finished yet. Only two of the four episodes have been released. And second, considering the whole Telltale controversy, how could I put this game at my number one spot? Well, that's simply because it's the most fun I've had with any game I've played this year. Not only that, but it's the most fun I've had with The Walking Dead as a whole. I've been following Clementine's journey from the very beginning, and just like the rest of the world, I'm both excited and terrified to see where it'll end up. 
And while I know that we still have a chance to end on a low note, especially with the whole bankruptcy debacle and company switcheroo and all that other fun stuff, I'm really, really hoping that it doesn't end up like that and this game gets made and told exactly in the way that the developers wanted it to be told before this whole bankruptcy stuff went down. I'm still willing to give The Walking Dead the final season the title of my game of the year because of how much I've enjoyed these first two episodes and because of how much the franchise as a whole has meant to me over the years. I hope all of you give this game a chance once it fully releases, and I hope you experience the Walking Dead games at some point in your life through your own choices, rather than just watching someone else play it. I promise you it's a completely different experience when it's your story. Whether or not you like this type of game, or what your thoughts are on the company as a whole, at the very least, The Walking Dead is a story that needs to be experienced by everyone. So I hope you'll go on that journey if you have not already. And here's hoping, we're all contempt with where we end up when all is said and done. So there you have it! That's my top 10 games of 2018. Let me know what your favorite games from this year were. They could be games that actually came out this year, or old ones that you're playing catch up on. And let me know what you're looking forward to in 2019. Thank you all for supporting me through a very tough and emotional year. Here's hoping that 2019 is a more hopeful time for all of us. Thank you all for everything. This is Midnight and Beyond, and I will see you all later. Good night.